started with our speaker. So uh, for those of you in the audience and online tonight, our speaker is DFW Tracker, Dwight Wilson. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dwight. Um, so Dwight's been able to study with some of the best trackers in the nation, including Tom Brown, John Young, Paul Resendez, Charles Warsham, and Nathan Hempton. He's worked on university wildlife projects and provided training to hundreds of students. He has also applied his skills and knowledge for federal law enforcement and elite military personnel. However, uh, Dwight is more comfortable around fellow naturalists and exploring nature. Who wouldn't be, right? So, <laughs> okay, well, um, let's give a warm welcome to Dwight Wilson. Thank you all very much. I uh, appreciate y'all being here. I am much more comfortable in nature than in front of a big crowd. However, I'm very comfortable around naturalists. Um, I love nature. All right, let's get started here. That's me. Uh, I was probably about four years old. That was when we first got back from our, my, probably my first rabbit hunt. And um, that's when I started just enjoying and becoming fascinated with nature, you know? Hunting was a way that we provided for uh, our meals. It was part of what we ate, you know, rabbit, squirrel, you name it. Uh, but that's me. I was four years old. Good, I was, I was young. Wow. And, and, and you notice the red tough skins, right? Those of you that know the trends. Yeah. So part of what I have done is in, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up on a small farm in the rural part of Missouri and learning tracking, but just learning about nature, always going out into the woods. I remember going out into the woods and a friend of mine reminded me of this story. And we were out hiking with my dad and we were jumping over this creek and I didn't make it and I fell in and my buddy said, yeah, I remember that because you cried. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't cry, that's for sure. You know, but we were little tights. And uh, I remember that, my dad watched my dad building a fire out there in the middle of the woods and then all of a sudden getting warmed up, getting dry and going back on with the rest of our day hiking. So I, those memories, I think for everybody that's a naturalist, you remember that first time when you enjoyed this plant or saw that tree or whatever. And for me, it was tracking. Tracks to me, wow. It's better than looking at a Rembrandt or a Picasso. Tracks to me are just beautiful. And, and they hold so much knowledge about wild animals that we don't see, okay? You're lucky when you get to see uh, a rabbit or a squirrel or a coyote or a bobcat. I mean, how many people in here have seen a wolf in the wild? Very few, well, there are quite a few. Well, you guys are naturalists anyway. <laughs> But no, it is, it's fascinating when you, because you don't always get to see the animal, but you can see the tracks that it leaves behind. And that's why I really love tracking. Well, what is tracking? Tracking is any evidence of an animal's presence within the environment. So sometimes it's gonna be that physical track that you can see. Sometimes it might be the scat or the poop that it leaves behind, right? And even that can yeah, be a wealth of information. Meeting. Sometimes it's the bed. Sometimes there we go. where they've been spending the night and sleeping. It can be all kinds of different things. A broken twig, deer rubs. It all tells a story of that animal in that environment and how other animals are reacting to that animal, whether it's prey or predator. So why do I track? Tracking reveals the secret life of wildlife. And that's what fascinates me. More so than just identifying a track, you get to where you can start to understand the story. And then you can tell the story of that animal. There's several animals that, like I have an area. One of the things that Tom Brown really impresses upon you, and I don't know, who, how many people know who Tom Brown is? Okay, Tom Brown has written a series of books. He was, <clears throat> he was raised by an Apache elder who he called grandfather or stalking wolf, and stalking wolf had never came in to live in the reservation life. So he still lived the old way, lived out in the forest. And, and, Tom, and Tom met grandfather and spent 
over 10 years being mentored by this man. So he was able to read the stories and that fascinated me. He wrote a great book in the 70s, late 70s, called The Tracker and talked about his life with grandfather. He's went on to write several, several books. So reading and understanding that secret life to me made these tracks come alive. Now this track right here, one, two, three, four prints. Okay. This is a, a fox squirrel. Okay. And you can see these are the front feet. These are the hind feet. So when the animal's moving, it's actually its hind feet are going beyond his front feet. Okay. So that tells you where the direction of travel, what animal it was, and where it's going. Over here, and this even fascinates me, there's a snake trail. Okay. But you can see all this old disturbance. You know, it, anything that's not what we consider baseline, that's the important part of being a naturalist is understanding what is baseline. How does this tree grow? How does grass grow? How does, you know, this certain plant look? What's it supposed to be? It all tells a story. And the more you understand how the story comes together, the more you'll be able to interpret it, okay? How do we learn how to track? I call this natural learning. Uh, it's coyote mentoring. John Young is the only man that Tom Brown ever mentored in the old way as Stalking Wolf mentored him, okay? And John Young has written several really good books. He's written really good books on bird language, understanding the language of birds, not just the sounds, but interpreting the language of birds. <clears throat> but grandfather, Coyote mentored Tom in a way, and what I mean by coyote mentoring is they never answer a question. They always have another question. So it's like, well, what's this? And you go, I don't know, what is that? Well, that's not good enough. What does it look like? They're always gonna be prying questions out of you. The who, what, when, where, why, and how of tracking, or this we would call the six grandfathers. Especially, uh, I learned this from the Lakota tradition, and this is just simple questioning. The who, what, when, where, why, and how of tracking. So when I go out into the woods, that's exactly what I'll do, is I'll start asking questions when I see something. And it's about problem solving. When I have questions, sometimes I'll, have, I'll leave the woods with more questions than I have answers, and that's fine. Sometimes I just don't know. But what I'll do is I'll go home and I'll journal it. I'll say, hey, what did I see? How big was it? I'll take measurements. I'll look at it, take photographs of it if I want to, or I'll sit down and draw what I'm seeing, okay? And then I can go back later and use my field guides as references. They have kind of, in a way, replaced having a mentor. And you can see right here in the, this picture, you see four round dots, okay? And this is a question I posed to Mr. Paul Resendez one time. I'm like, I can't see any toes. How do I know what this is? He's like, well, take a measurement. So you start measuring, and you'll see that these animals in certain gates will move, certain animals will move in, in very specific ways, okay? Whether you're a tall animal or a short animal, uh, like a raccoon, a raccoon moves in a different way than, let's say, a coyote will move, okay? This right here is a very common lope for a striped skunk. So you start measuring what you see, the compressions and the overall length and start looking at how these tracks are put together. Then you get into the back of some of these books and they'll tell you between 21 inches or 22 inches, that this is gonna be a striped skunk. So the more information that you start to gather, the easier your problem solving. And that's all the difference, like Paul Resendez told us, the only difference between a beginner tracker and a master tracker is how many layers of information you've seen. How many files do you have in your file cabinet? When you're first starting out, you're looking at the robin and you're going, oh wow, that's a robin. Is it? How do you know? And you go through that process then of saying, well, it's not a toe, it's a robin. And this is why I know that, okay? So that's a striped skunk. 
one of the key things, too, is I always tell people to engage your senses. Tracking is not just a visual art, but it is also about engaging your senses. What do you smell? You know, what do you feel? Where, which way is the wind blowing? Is the sun on your face? Which way, where is the moon at at this particular time? Okay, your skin is like your largest sense that you have, my sense of hearing. <clears throat> and when we go out on Saturday, I'm going to make sure that you guys get to see tracks, hear tracks, and feel tracks. So you're engaging your senses. We did an exercise with Charles one time where we tracked a human that went through a a pine forest, and we did it by smell. So you were blindfolded, and you had to smell where each track was. And it, we didn't catch up to anything, but it was still fun, you know? So you're pro always problem solving, journal, and leave the field with more questions than you have answers. Change your point of view. I always tell people, go from looking at the track to like what they call eagle vision or your bird's eye view. Where does this track fit into where you are at that particular time? So now you're not only looking at the track, but you're looking up and around you to see how this track fits into your area. Now, do you see other tracks? Like they're here, we have other tracks going down this dirt road. So you start gathering more information. Now I'm looking at the tracks, I'm looking at the trail. If I want to even, we can go inside the track and start looking in the track. It's like having a fingerprint, okay? When you, if you put your fingers on something, you'll see that fingerprint lift up. Animals have the exact same type print and it's very unique to them. Humans have a very unique footprint that you can use to identify somebody with. So change your point of view. Understand the difference in the play between light and shadow. Sometimes when the sun gets up high, it's harder to see tracks. So you can use your hat to cover up the tracks and they'll pop out to you. And sometimes you have to, especially like track in the early morning or late in the evenings when you have that sun at that big angle, okay? And you can see your tracks a little bit better because of the light and the shadow. And why do we see tracks? Okay, this gets into understanding art, your lines, your shape, your form, your texture, and the color. How do we know that's a track? It's like the Grand Canyon is nothing but a big track that happened over time that tells the story of that water that moved down through there. So what is your baseline and what do you see? I had a hard time with this with with uh, Charles Warsham. He was probably one of my more difficult instructors that I ever had, because I was like going, man, dude, you're weird. But anyway, <laughs> so what Charles wanted us to do is he took us out on some tracks, and he said, okay, what is this? I'm looking at him going, those are deer tracks. And then he posed a question to me, how do you know they're deer tracks? Well, because they're deer tracks. But no, what he really wanted me to get at was look at the line, look at the shape, look at the color difference between the, the ground on the outside around that disturbance and looking at the disturbance. That's how we start aging tracks, okay? So he wanted us to not name something, but to understand why we were looking at what we were looking at. Here's a nice track. Anybody know who made this track right here? Any guesses? Okay, I'll let you guys know. This is a track made by our farm dog, dog on my parents' farm. All you are looking at, and really all you're seeing, is these, uh-oh, whoops. Okay, as you're looking at where the nails hit on this front foot, okay? And then this is the nails from the hind foot, okay? but you're looking at it upside down in this photo. So sometimes you change your perspective and now look at it. Makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? Okay, and it's like, how do I know that? I saw the dog make the track, <laughs> you know, it's cheating, but, that, but that's how you learn, okay? So how do you learn like aging of tracks? 
okay, well, I just saw that deer walk right through that area. So I'm going to run down there, and I'm going to look at those deer tracks. And then I'm going to cheat. If you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough, right? I mean, so I'll take a popsicle stick, and I'll write down when I saw this event happen. Maybe it might be to the exact hour or the exact minute, okay? I'll put it in the ground close by where I saw that deer make that track. And then I know at 3.15 yesterday, that deer made that particular track. So I can come back in 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 15 minutes or an hour or two hours later or the next day or next week, and I'll see that popsicle stick down there, and I'll see that deer track. And then I can say, okay, this is what's happened weather-wise. I've had rain or no rain, or it's been really hot, but it was rainy when this track was made, you know, so I knew it was fresh then. And, but now you're starting to learn how to age that particular track. So you ever see a popsicle stick out there? I didn't do it. I'm just saying. So let's look at this guy. This is a, a real typical summertime coyote with a very thin coat right here in Texas, okay? And I, 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 we, I put together some sheets, some cheat sheets for y'all. So make sure that you get them and, and we'll bring some out on Saturday. But <clears throat> if you have four toes and claw marks, okay, it's gonna be a member of the dog family. And you see how this is you have toes right across from each other, the inner digits, the outer digits, this nice little heel pad, and you see little bitty nails, okay? And you've got this nice X formed right here in this oval shape. That's gonna be a dog track, okay? Or a coyote track, member of the dog family. Now, some dogs that get a lot of exercise, their toes will look a lot like this but you see dogs that are living in the city, their toes are gonna to be more round and a little bit more sloppy because they don't have that type of exercise on them. And their trails will look different. Now, how can you tell the front feet from the hind feet? The front feet are about 30% larger than the hind feet, okay? The hind feet do the pushing, the front feet carry the extra weight of the neck, the shoulders and the head. So now when you're looking, you can start to feel, okay, where, where was this animal looking at, okay? Does anybody want to get down on all fours? Okay, okay, okay. Do this at home in the privacy of your own house. But, but get down on your hands and knees, okay? Close your eyes and have your head just right there in that one position. Now, anytime that I do experiments, I try to go to extremes, okay? So look all the way over here and feel what happens to your body. And you'll, you'll start to understand, okay, what's going on with that coyote? Where was that coyote looking at? Okay, so now you're looking at front feet, hind feet, and head movement. Okay, when a deer starts feeding, what happens? Going down. So the front part of their hooves will actually go a little bit deeper into the ground than when they're walking. So now you're starting to put together these little bitty stories, okay? So four toes, four claws, dog family. Now, coyotes do all kinds of really cool things. And like I told you, it's not just tracks that we're looking at. Sometimes we're looking at like down here, whoops, my bad, hang on, okay. Sometimes we're looking at these little areas like this, which you see under cover, nice soft earth that's been removed so they can stay nice and cool when they're laying down, okay? Over here, we found a rock that was left at the corner of an intersection, and this is wet. I mean, you could smell it. And so <clears throat> this was left by a coyote and you can smell it, it smells very skunky, uh, their urine does, but they will mark areas and territory with urine. And then up here, you'll see scat. Now scat will tell you the health of an animal and it'll tell you even where it's been. If you find a coyote 
uh, scat that has persimmon seeds in it, where's the lowest, nearest persimmon tree? Okay, if you don't have any only in this one area, you know that that particular coyote has ate at persimmons at that particular spot. And that's cool. Now you're starting to mark out where this animal is going. And coyotes will also leave scat at the intersections of trails. They like to mark high spots. They like to mark trails. Okay. But then you'll always get one guy, especially in the coyote family, that doesn't read the manual and does something completely different. There's a group of uh, riding trails, mountain bike trails I used to go to over at uh, Louisville Lake. Okay, And the mountain bikers always go one, pretty much just one direction on the trails. And right around the corner of this trail, I, f I started finding uh, coyote scat left right there in the trail. And it was purple. And you're like, purple? What? Well, they were eating the, the fruit from the cactus at that time during the heat of the summer. And so you're like going, okay, well, that's kind of neat. Yes, sir. Yes, that was the next thing I was going to say. Grasshoppers. So talk about fast food. Here you are, just, just cruising down the trail. Grasshopper hops in front of you. Oh, yeah. Chomp. There you go. Chomp. Now I was hungry, but now I'm doing all right. So, right? So, yeah, I, that, that tells you about what's going on in the environment. How are they hunting? Well, they're going after whatever they can eat that's the easiest to go for. To, uh, to go for. So that's very cool when you find stuff like that. I'm always fascinated by uh, <clears throat> I gave uh, one of my elders, uh, Red Dog, uh, I, he, he's a Lakota elder, a pipe holder and a sun dancer. I gave him, I actually gave him this book, a copy of Paul Rosinda's book of tracking. And he looked through it so intent and looking at it. He's like going, you know, they should call this book Paws and Poop. I like, yep. <laughs> so, so yeah. This is um, this is coyote. Let's look at this. R the red fox. Of course, we have some red fox here. I've seen usually more gray fox in my area. Okay, and see, and that's neat. Like I, uh, we were talking just a little bit about our sit areas. I have a sit area where. I had so many interactions with this one particular gray fox all the time until she had her young. And then I, I just kind of wondered, you know, what did she tell her kid about me, the crazy guy that goes out and sits in the woods, that he's like, he's, he's always following me around. I don't know what the deal is with this guy. So, but some of the, her kids I knew their entire lives. So you could tell their story. And I always thought that that was neat. So one time out in my sit yard, in my sit area, uh, I was out there, and this goes into bird language. How many birders do we have here? A bunch, right? I love birding. And so I remember getting lessons from John Young about birds and how birds interact with other animals and humans and stuff. And, and I always found that kind of interesting. Well, we had this effect called popcorn, where the animal, where if an animal pushes through, uh, a, a hedgerow, the little brown birds that live on the on the floor that want to be close to the ground will fly up. Okay, and so here comes this fox. Now I didn't know I couldn't see the fox because the fox was on the other side of this of this little hedgerow, this tree line. But the birds, I saw the birds coming up. Okay, and here they go. And then I see this whatever was pushing them. Okay, and I was like, man, what is pushing them? Because as soon as they came down to here, now these birds just immediately went back. So you had this whole effect of coming up and, and coming back down and all this noise. So I ran through in, uh, this little bitty area in the woods and turned the corner, and boom, right there was a little gray fox. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So I was pretty proud of myself, and then, and then I wasn't because I was like, okay, I should have known that. But, and I... I just interrupted some good hunting, but you know, whatever. So, so gray foxes, red foxes. Now, red foxes are, are were imported from Europe. Okay, so they act differently. The fox hunters brought them over because the gray foxes were no fun to hunt, as they would just run up the trees. Okay, and so you start learning that, and you'll see 
really odd. You'll see gray fox tracks go right up into that area that's dirt that's right around a tree and then disappear. And you're like, okay, who's watching me? But they have cat medicine, and that's how we explain things sometimes. So if you understand that a gray fox has cat medicine, you'll understand their trail. Bobcats. This photo was taken from a game camera at Leela, of all places. And that's a bobcat that was out there. This is a picture of the tracks of this animal from out there. So when you're looking at bobcats, okay, you're looking at four toes, okay? Now, four toes without claws. But if you do this with your hands, you're going to see this toe is going to be a little bit further out, okay? And so we call that a lead toe. So when we're looking at the front feet, they're 30% larger than the hind feet, and we're looking at evidences of a lead toe. So I know this is going to be the left foot, and this is going to be the right foot. Okay, so now you're not only going with head movement, you're going with front feet, back feet, and now you're knowing left from right. You're just gathering information. Raccoons. Okay, raccoons love to leave scat. Okay, and especially up on logs. It's a great place to set a nice little trail camera. A, a log going across the stream, you'll get some great pictures. The hind feet, okay, this is the hind foot of a raccoon. Looks a little bit more like a foot. And then the front is much more hand-like, okay, but small. And of course, this is raccoon skull. And that was found out at Leela by actually one of the master naturalists in that area. Possums. For possums, if you do this, okay, you've got this crazy thumb on the hind foot way out there. And that's one of the ways that you can see in uh, possum tracks. There it is right there. So you have your hand, your fingers, and then your thumb. And this crazy star pattern right here, that's going to be the front foot. So you have front and hind feet. Armadillos. Armadillos are absolutely fascinating animals. Usually you're only going to see two and three. Okay? Two and three, but they actually will have four and five. Very rare that you get those outer toes when you're tracking armadillos. And then, of course, these are going to tell a story, too. All of these different burrows. And sometimes, a lot of times, they're going to be multi-use, used by several animals. But can you find tracks there? Can you find any sign of them in that area? White-tailed deer. Okay. White-tails. If you do this, okay, you're going to notice that this is a little bit longer than this finger. And that's going to give you the difference between your lefts and your rights when you're looking at deer tracks. Okay? It's not much. It's just a little. I, don't, I can't remember if I have hog tracks in here or not. But white-tailed deer tracks from hog tracks, white-tailed deer tends to be a little bit more pointed at the front, and hog tracks are a little bit thicker and a little bit more round. And that just depends on the size of the hog, which is weird. I worked a, a wildlife project out in East Texas tracking hogs, and good grief, there's some big hogs out there. You know, I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Okay, so we're looking at other sign, deer rubs. And here you can see those dew claws in these tracks. And how it's splayed out, and you can tell how much energy that animal was using and putting out at that time. And then of course you have your scat. Okay, poop always tells you a story. Okay, feral hogs. These are feral hog tracks. You see how round these are compared to those sharp pointed ones of the deer. So this is going to be your hog. You're going to have your wallers where they just get in there and rub around. And these tend to be a little bit lower and you'll find a lot of hair in their rubs when they rub things. 
beaver sign, beaver tracks, okay? You usually don't see all the toes, but you can see some evidence of webbing. And then, of course, your chews. Your chews are always going to know, going to let you know. And sometimes you won't see dams down here. You'll just see holes in the banks where they're going to stay. I kind of call them bank beavers. And it's, it's really kind of interesting. I was going to do, and I still am, uh, do some wildlife research in, in Ukraine. I have some friends that live over there. Uh, war's going on right now. But I got sent this really cool video <laughs> of these guys. That they were in the trenches, and uh, one of the guys had dragged out a beaver out of the trench, you know, and they called him his, their little engineer. And he, he scurried off away from them, and, uh, and was, he was off to go do a mission and was going to flood the Russians. Anyway, that was the story that these guys put out. I thought it was kind of cute, but I thought it was funny. It wasn't a beaver. It wasn't the American beaver that we're used to, but you could obviously tell. And then uh, it just, it struck me because I was looking at trees and go, well, that's a willow tree. That's an oak tree. That, that's a pine, some kind of pine tree. I don't know exactly what kind of tree it is, but you're looking at it going, okay, I get it. Now I know, you know, like my science teacher is always trying to tell, you, tell us how things all kind of get lined up and the scientific stuff. I was like, okay, now I know why they do that. <laughs> like, it makes sense. I should have studied. Yes. All the above. Most of us to get... Oh, so the, the question was, uh, what are the deer doing when they're rubbing? Are they scenting? But they're, they're, sometimes they will, they're scenting for sure because they will also dig and urinate in little holes close by, but they're also rubbing that velvet off of their antlers. So they're sharpening up so that it's time for the rut. Does that make sense? But you're going to see, you're going to smell it too. So that's something that I always encourage you to do when you're out tracking or just out in nature. Go through your senses, right? Usually we put on programs where I purposely like to partner people up and blindfold them. Okay, now listen to what is actually going on around you. Feel, what do you smell? Start asking these questions because there's so many times that we just don't engage our senses, you know? But it's like wildflower season right now, right? I can smell them, you know? But you can also smell like that honeysuckle right? And, and it smells great. It's like, I don't know. Smell will always kind of bring you back into your memories. And, and so I always encourage you to get out of your mind and get into your senses, right? Kind of thing. Eastern cottontail, okay? And this is a neat little photo right here. You can see this, I have a compass here, but... <clears throat> The hind foot right here, the hind foot here, okay, how long they were. So this animal actually not only hopped into this position, but set up to get that sprint. And I find that's pretty, pretty fascinating, right? Okay, now here's a real whodunit, okay? Because it's kind of like going out on a wilderness crime scene. Okay, who did it? Predator and prey, who came first and why? Okay, do we see we up here, we've got the coyote. Right here, we've got the rabbit. So who came first and who came second? Anybody? Think the coyote was first? Or do you think the rabbit was first? Did the coyote see or have any interest in the rabbit at all? Did he slow down? Did he step again? Did he look around? Or is, is he just kind of traveling through? Just kind of traveling through, right? So then we have the rabbit that's crossing the road. He was like, whew, <laughs> that was good. I, I'm here afterwards, you know? But <clears throat> if we would have, I would have hoped, unless this coyote was full at the time, you know, and, and just headed home, I would have thought we would have seen some interest in these tracks. So then we start looking at it and start telling that story and start aging. Okay, so here's some of the resources. 
I brought a few of my books. I'll put out more resources and more books for y'all. Um, and even my books, you can get my books, my two books off of Amazon, but I'm getting ready to redo them. I'm gonna put them out as free PDFs because I just want people tracking. I think, you know, anything that's gonna grab somebody's interest that leads them into becoming a naturalist, I think is the ticket. Do you like fishing? Do you like hunting? You know, uh, do you like wildflowers? Like right now is blue bonnet season, you know? What's gonna draw your attention or draw somebody's attention into nature? And I think that's so important. For me, for me, it was <clears throat> reading about Tom Brown. After I'd gotten out of the military, uh, I was just, you know, didn't really care to go back into the woods any, anymore. I always lugged a bunch of gear around with me and we road marched everywhere. So I wanted to do more with less. And that's when I got into reading about Tom Brown. I, a book was given to me, The Tracker, and I was just fascinated with what he knew and what that he could do with very little, okay? So going out into the woods uh, with very little. And that led me into studying with John Young, with Paul Resendez, and then Mark Elbrock. And Elbrock has put out kind of what we trackers consider the Bible, you know, not in a, try not to say that in a bad way, but his book is just fascinating. And he's done a book on skulls and he's done a, an entire book on nothing but bird tracks. So can you track birds? Yes. You can track, you can see the bird sign and tracks, even feather identification. You know, what fascinates you? Is it skills? Well, if you love primitive skills, which I do, how do you know what a cottonwood tree is? What can I do with a cottonwood tree? Well, I can make a bow drill set out of it. Well, what kind of fire do I need? I need a fire that's gonna burn hot so that I can cook this meat on. Okay, well, pine is not very good for that, but oak is very good. So do I know the difference between these two trees? And now I'm starting to learn. Do I know 10 trees? Do I know, you know, 10 plants, medicinal plants? There's an entire garden outside if you know where to look. But what captures somebody and brings them into appreciating nature and becoming a naturalist? And for me, it was definitely tracking. Uh, like I said, I just grew up being fascinated by the stories and, and everything. And this is, this is all I have for you guys. Do you have questions? Yes, sir. Well, whoops. Uh, we've got some uh, beehives on the other side of Farmersville. And what I've found out is, because we've got them in different locations, something is burrowing a hole underneath the supports for the beehives. And they're about this big around. And something's burrowing and living under them. Have any idea what that might be? Is the hole round or yeah, is it Yeah, it's round. Round and going down as an angle underneath uh, the support for the hives. Wow. Um is there anything that eats dead bees? Not that I know of. <laughs> okay. I I'm sure something does. Yeah. You know, but not that I know of, but they're probably taking advantage of soft dirt. I mean, as a matter of fact, that could be even raccoons at certain times of the year. Okay. But right. um I was th hoping that you'd say more oval because I'm kind of thinking, you know, skunks have probably been in there or armadillos have been in there. That could be. If they're one. taking advantage of soft dirt, then anything could be living inside there. It's like rabbits don't really need holes here. It doesn't get that cold. So they'll live in small forms, but they will take over a hole so if you, it's available. You, you know that bees, when they die inside the hive, they throw the body out. Wow. Okay. Just, it's laying outside. Something, they only live a few weeks, and when they die, they toss them out. Wow. So something's eating them on the ground. So, and so, so somebody, somebody's definitely eating them then. Yeah, mm -hmm. something. something. Wow. I'll have to look that up. More questions, right? There's always something, and that's fine. If you don't know, you don't know. There's always, always pose the question because it might be a, a year later or six months later, and then all of a sudden you'll go, oh, wow, okay, now I get it. You know, That's like me understanding how they classify animals and birds and stuff like that. I don't even know what that thing's called. But, but the scientists know that, and they put it out there in Latin and everything. And so it's pretty cool, and now it makes sense to me. 
you know, because if I go to another country, you're going to see that's the thing that when I was uh, looking at uh, wildlife in Ukraine, they have a wild cat, but it's not a bobcat. It's not a mountain lion, but it is a wild cat, you know, and they have so many similar species. They have a bear species there, but it's not a black bear and it's not a brown bear. It's nothing that we're used to. But you can kind of see how things are branched out and what position they feel, whether they're predator or prey. And, and that's just fascinating to me. So anything else? Yes. Hang on, I'm coming. Oh, hang on. You said the smartphone app iTracks. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, thought I had it on my phone. I left my phone out there. I try not, I don't know how to turn my phone off and on. Very Anyway, that's a whole other story with me and technology. But Jonah Evans has uh, created a app called iTracks, and it's very good. I mean, it's like Mark Elbrock's book, but now you've got it on an app on your phone that you can take to the woods with you. And he's even got information on what this animal, their, their home range, you know, where you're going to find them what they eat, what they like. He's got scat, pictures of tracks, you name it, skulls, all kinds of things downloaded into uh, that app. And I think he has a free version and then a paid version, but it is just fantastic. Instead of carrying some of these heavy books around, you can just put that in your pocket and you've got so much information right there. It is a great app. And Jonah Evans is, at least the last time I talked to him, he was working in Texas for Texas Parks and Wildlife working a mountain lion study way out west. So, yeah, very cool. But iTrax is awesome. I've got it. I use it a lot. I'll bring it out on Saturday so that people can see it. Okay, so speaking of Saturday, we did have a question online, um, and this may be something we need to coordinate. Um, uh, for anyone who cannot make the, the hike on Saturday, um, would you be interested in, in having another one? Um, oh soon and we can we can talk about that and see if we can't get something yeah. else scheduled to follow up we can do something this fall yeah. <laughs> i'd say that was very well received so <laughs> I, I i just absolutely love tracking i enjoy being out in nature just looking around and i mean you know poking stuff with a stick it's kind of what i do <laughs> I try to figure things out i'm always trying to figure things out and i'll have people that call me I said, you know, I saw this yellow gooey stuff. And I thought about you. <laughs> and I'm like, nice, right, send me a picture. Let's see what it is. You know? So turned out to be some kind of yellow fungus thing that grows out in the woods, right? Yeah, it's cool. Anyway. So yes, what is an armadillo doing when it's, you know, you see usually only two or three, but sometimes five of the claws? What what's going on? The difference. It just between... depends on substrate. Yeah, they don't make, you know, sometimes the ground here in Texas will get just hard as a rock. You can't even drive a nail into it, you know, and then other times. But it, yeah, it's just the animals really light, you know, Texas is a hard place to track in. And that's why sometimes you're not even looking for tracks. You're looking for sign. Where are the pathways? What What's running towards water? But yeah, you know, sometimes you can I don't even have, I think, a perfect tr picture of a track with all five. I had a friend that made a plaster casting that had all five and all four, and he sent it to me. I'm like, good grief. Cool. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it just depends. And sometimes, you know, it, it's like looking at head turns. One of the things that when I did some tracking with the FBI, I taught several classes for them, but I would go out on tracks with them um, when they wanted my skills. And part of it was we have people that dump bodies out in the woods, and here's my $3 word that I know, disarticulated remains. I did that really well. And so, so that's what they would bring me out. They want to gather as much of that evidence back as possible. And you have scavenger animals that will scatter these bones everywhere. And, you know, it sounds kind of weird, but that's what happens. And they've had a couple of incidences where coyotes have been seen carrying heads around, which is odd, I know, but... You know, and then the question becomes, can you, did I, what did I do? Okay. Um, can you uh, tell if this is carrying around an eight pound head? Well, yes, you can. And so the thing is, is we did experiments with that so that we could learn about it. 
we actually put pig bodies out and took photos of them and documented everything that we could learn, you know, from interactions with scavenger animals and from flies and how long does it take for flies to get on the carcass and all this type of stuff, um, which was fascinating. We had a lot of help uh, with that, a lot of people in the area that helped. Um, so yeah, it is, it, it, it's neat. I had, um, I always tell you, always go to extremes, okay? So, this is me. I, I don't do this now. I, now I have to kind of live a little bit more socially. But at one time, I had a big sandbox in my house that I would move around. And I had it located in between the bathroom and the living room. So when somebody would come over and they say, hey, man, I need to use your bathroom. I'm like, well, wait a minute. How bad do you really need to go right now? Well, not real bad. Well, I want to just go to the bathroom. I'm like, eh. Why don't you sit down and drink this real quick? <laughs> and so I'd fill them up with water and then send them to the tracking box. And then when they would walk back out, they'd walk out of the tracking box, you know? And you're looking at the differences in the tracks. And you're going, okay, cool. <laughs> That's good information. So, so when I was tracking somebody, you would always be able to, you know, you're, you're just gathering information. Can you find a person that's right-handed versus left-handed? Can you find an animal that is left dominant versus right dominant. Well, yeah, you can. You know, how does this animal go up to this tree and turn light or turn left? If you're trailing a deer, the first thing that the deer is going to do is you're going to see this big white tail pop up. Boop. Right, draws your eyes in, and then it will bound off. Maybe you just even two, three bounds, and then boom, drop that tail down and disappear. But it's still there. Now, if that deer, depending upon the terrain, is right dominant, it will circle back around to you on the right, and you can set up and watch for it to come back. If it's left, it'll go around to the left. But that depends, is it uphill, downhill? Is there water here? Is there heavy terrain there? That kind of thing. So uh, people will kind of do the same thing once you start learning people and starting to track and trail people. Some of the military guys that I work with um, got really good at tracking people. You know, uh, I worked with a, a man named Nate Kempton, Kempton who's now in Africa uh, tracking and working uh, for uh, charity organizations over there, NGOs, and uh, just fascinating guy. This guy was so good at tracking. He's probably one of the best trackers I've ever spent a lot of time with in the woods. And he grew up trapping animals. That's what he did for a living. That's how he earned his money. And uh, he was an old, older, hope he never sees this. Or here's that I called him old. He is older than me. I consider him my big brother. But the way he grew up uh, in Arizona, he grew up trapping animals. And he can go into an area and read the, the trails of what's going on. If a farmer calls him and says, hey, they're killing my sheep. I want the coyotes out of here. Well, you don't want all of them out of here. You just want the one that's causing the bad behavior. Okay. So he would go in and remove just that one coyote from that group, and then the behavior would change, you know. But he always kept a couple of dead coyotes in his refrigerator, in his freezer, and throw them in the back of his truck. So that way, when he'd drive by the farmer, he'd be like, man, you got them all. He's like, yep, sure did. Boom, he's gone, right? They were, then he'd go home and he'd put them all back in the freezer, you know. Everything was good. But he told, he told me in all seriousness, he's like, I'll take you trapping with me and tell me which foot you want me to catch this animal with and what, an, or what which animal should be catched. He was that good at it. And so there's some people out there that are just absolutely phenomenal um, with their skills. And those people are dying out slow but sure, you know. Uh, hopefully maybe one of these times Nathan can come out here and talk when he comes back from Africa. But I consider him my big brother. Because, you know, we're just two weird dudes that enjoy going out and looking at tracks. <laughs> Any other questions? Dwight, I, I do have a question, uh, animal question. Yes. Um, in East Denton County, a couple of times, I think around the Little Elm area, we were seeing trees, pretty large trees that were chewed on that we thought were beaver. We thought it was beaver, you know, beaver damage. And we put them in an iNaturalist, but a couple of people came back and said it really looked like porcupine, not beaver. Are you running into any porcupines no. in the Leela area or in that area? And no. How, how would you tell the difference anyway? 
Because I think they do chew on trees too, right? Yeah, but correct? they usually don't chew chew on trunks. It's been my experience with porcupines that they chew they they chew on branches, and so underneath a tree you'll see dropped branches down there that look like beavers have been chewed on them. But man, I haven't seen really any porcupine in this area. Not to say that they're not, that they're not, you know, but that's interesting. And they've got all kinds of cool stuff out at Leela. You know, the trails have kind of changed out there. There was a lot more dirt trails, which was nice for a tracker, but not so nice for bringing families out with, you know. Yeah, we always get that balance. And that's just like with urban coyotes, you know. If we, the, we can educate people about urban coyotes and we can change our behavior towards them, then maybe we can, you know, not have some of those negative interactions. Because I know in Arlington, uh, they were having problems with coyotes and they got really worried about them. They trapped one coyote out and I think it kind of went away now, which is good. But every time we keep building houses into areas, we're gonna encroach on them. We just gotta learn to live with them and change behavior. That's just like with bears, uh, you know, out in Yellowstone and places like that, they've had problems with, with bears breaking into cars and raiding campsites and stuff like that. Then they came out with the bear boxes, you know, and at one time people were just feeding bears junk from the trash and so these trash bears were now habituated to that change your behavior change what they're doing yes sir in yellowstone they used to have a big trash dump that was one of the attractions people would go to the trash dump to see the bears yeah and they finally decided to close all those dumps to make the bears go wild again because they were you know, they were eating that trash and breaking into cars. And but once they closed the trash dump, then the bears went back to the woods. And yeah, they went back to being wild. Yeah, when they knew they couldn't get food. Yeah, right. yeah their behavior changed. Way back in the back, yes, sir. Uh, I'll pick up. <laughs> yep, online. Yeah. Online. Okay. Well, they can't hear me. Um. We've, we've camped a lot in Yellowstone, but years ago, probably maybe 30 years ago, when I was uh, a lot younger, I was two years old, and uh, the, the park ranger was telling us a story about uh, a bear. There was a guy cooking breakfast in their campground, camped all around it, and a guy was cooking his breakfast, bacon and all this kind of stuff, and a bear came up, deciding he was going to eat that. The guy was scared, so he climbed a tree. And he climbs this tree, and he's hiding from the bear, screaming for help. And a whole bunch of campers got all the way in a big circle around the bear, taking pictures of him. And the, be and the bear goes, can't see any way out. He goes up the tree. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it took a while for the, to get the people to leave and get the bear down. Oh. <laughs> the guy yeah, yeah, no. You, and I'm sure everybody's heard this joke, you know. These two hikers were going down the trail and here in the middle of the big trail, they saw this big black bear, big brown bear, some kind of big bear. And, and so the one of them starts dropping his pack, starts digging out and grabbing his tennis shoes. And he's like, you know, we can't outrun this bear. He's like, I ain't got to outrun the bear, just to run outrun you. <laughs> and then he took off. So yeah, bears are very fascinating animals. I. I would like to study bears a little bit more, to be honest with you. I've got to track wolves an awful lot. And to, to be out sleeping in a tent or to be around a campfire at night and hear wolves howl in the wild is just absolutely amazing. You know, it'll make the hair on the back of your head, neck stand. <laughs> but it's very cool. It's very cool, you know. Got another one? So um, this past weekend, um, I shadowed Rick on a trail guide, and we came across this white, fluffy stuff. And I couldn't tell if it was fur or down, like from a bird or something. I think the only way we could have probably told was like to get a magnifying glass or look closer at it to figure out if it was fur or some kind of down. Yeah. Do you use anything to to Oh. magnify anything and what what do you use what do you, that's easy to carry around with I'll you I'll just take a small magnifying glass put it in my pocket 
and I'll take like uh, I'll take some string with me, you know, uh, about three or four feet of string. I'll take a small tape measure, you know, uh, some index cards and some pencils or pens and uh, some popsicle sticks. <laughs> Believe me, I can get popsicle sticks. Something I can do. But uh, anyway, yeah, and and so. So yeah, absolutely. Take take a small kit with you. You'll see in a lot of my pictures, I didn't have uh, measurements in there because I just wanted to take pictures of the track. But it's good when you're starting out to record, to take measurements, and that will help you learn and build those files that you have that you can put in your file cabinet and go back on. And then eventually you want to move away from the tape measure and be able to say, okay, well, that track is about a thumb's width or that track is about as big as my palm, uh, as my hand in a fist, or that track is from here to here, you know. So does iTracks only do like prints or does, could you also do feathers and fur in there too? I think he has a small section of that on there. I'm not sure. Um, but I know that he has all the detailed measurements and the gates that those animals walk in and move in. And so uh, that's real important. I bet he has... Uh, feathers in there but we'll we'll look uh, are you coming out saturday can you i can't this okay. saturday well we'll some <laughs> I'd of love the, to though some of the folks that are coming out we'll look through that and um and, and i'll take a look and, and let you all know because i i think it's absolutely uh an incredible tool that um that jonah evans made uh, he's a very good tracker there's some organizations out there i'm not really involved with them my tracking is a little bit different, but they have, uh, what is it, the North American Master Trackers Association or something. I'll, I'll get some of that information. I need to get that down because they're a really good growing organization that do evaluations of your tracking skills, which I think is great. But to me, I, I can look at that and say, okay, well, that's a mouse track, but I don't care what mouse it is. It, that doesn't really fascinate me. But the fact that there are mice there, that does, you know. So, and, and it just depends. A lot of them are young biologists, and so they're using that skill to make their job, uh, you know. Uh, the certifications all came from Africa, and the uh, the Africans there, uh, it was a thing called Cyber Tracker that they used that was originally a Palm Pilot and a GPS, and now it's just all in the same kind of thing. But it's icon driven so they could click on it and it record the information at that GPS location. And so they could hand that over to a biologist. And now it's a lot like, I think, uh, I, yeah, yeah, which I think, which I think is awesome, you know, because now you're recording things and letting other people know, hey, what have, what have you seen? The fact that, what was it, a painted bunny that was around here, Bunsen? That, that's cool. <laughs> So, so yeah, um, I tracks. Jonah's a good guy. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Thank you all so much for being out here. Appreciate it. Well, we have a ton of comments on here about how wonderful this has been and informative and engaging. So thank you so much. And let me You're welcome. come thank get you Thank you all this. so much. I on on behalf of the blackland prairie chapter of master naturalist here's a thank you gift thank hopefully you. it is a book you do not have so um Very cool. it, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> you'd be surprised how many of those i own exactly and, and, 